and have your journals out because this is like tourism stuff. Like when you go to China, yeah, like when you go to China, if you remember this stuff, when you go to Beijing, you'll be like, oh wow, you will have, right? So. They, they have. Okay, Mao Zedong was the chairman of the Communist Party from 1949 when he won the Civil War until 1976 when he died. And then, what do you have to do? Our leader is dead. What do you have to do? Get a new leader. Okay. So, our friend on Facebook, our young Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, our young Pitts, our young boy in Pittsburgh, a young college student who knows everything, but he's a college student. He claims that democracy is the answer. Now's death. Let's let the people vote for his successor. Not the single party dictatorship. How would you how would you do the succession thing? Because you saw Kang Shi and Yong Zhang both had like different policies. What do you think is a good policy when you're not in dictatorship to assure that the best person gets the next one? You think being like the councils who elect a new leader. Do you think the council system is a better idea? Does anybody think that the council system has any dangers inherent in it? How might corruption affect a council's decision on successor? A uh, successor might bribe a council member to vote a certain way. Uh, uh, succession candidate might bribe people to vote for him. Does anybody think there's another way? Because the Communist Party has this today, yeah. Uh, in Rome, there a lot of the councilmen will always like, be planning assassinations. And so that that leads you to say that the best method of succession in a non-democratic system would be: Do you have one? The danger of assassination. I'm gonna I'm gonna kill my rival. Is that what you is that you're talking about? Or I'm gonna kill the emperor. I, the count, the councilman might be. Uh, I'm not hearing the word for it, but opportunistic. I'm not clear on what you're saying, dude. What are you saying? That they would poison the king so that their person gets the throne? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Is that no. what you're saying? In a way, he, in a way, we think, John. Wipe the cobweb from your eyes, woman, and spread your washing proper. Sorry, that's James Joyce Ulysses. I don't know why I said that. Marissa, what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure. Come back to me in a few minutes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come back to me in a few minutes. The first thing I want to show you is this. So what was called? Oh, hell and damnation. No. Really? I oh, no. Wrong computer. It's another computer. What? What? Uh, just real quickly. Okay. First of all, this is the effect of Qianlong. Okay. Look at this China. This is Qing China. Now, how is it different than the China that we've come to know and love so well when we talk about the shape of China? Um, it has Mongolia in it. Huh? It has Mongolia in it. It has Mongolia in it. Okay. The Ming Dynasty was only this big. So please, this is this is today's China. This is one of the High Qing's legacies. Xinjiang, I've already told you about the Takamakan Desert, right? So now it is part of China proper, not China proper, part of territorial China. And I told you what religion reigns here, yes? Do you know this? This is like current events stuff. Islam. So you want to say I'm educated about China, I studied in high school and all this sort of stuff? Well, if you don't know the significance of Xinjiang conquering Xinjiang, it is a, as, as Salvador does know, this is, I mean, new territory. This is Muslim. And so it literally shares a little slice of border, I think right about right here, with Afghanistan. So Taliban, Al-Qaeda, all sorts of stuff, right? They've got, like, separatist Muslims in Xinjiang who China's having religious problems with right now. Okay, so so Xinjiang, the Uyghur population, things like that in your journal. Just put like Qing legacy somewhere, a little box, Qing legacy to today's China. 
Because it's in the news. France is abolishing uh, certain, like the, the Muslim burqa and women's dress and such for security reasons and also for assimilationist reasons. France is trying to like, stop the, the Muslims in France from becoming sort of separatists. They want them to assimilate and take on French ways, and so they're banning the Muslim headdress that women wear to cover their heads. They're doing all sorts of things in the same time in response to the threat or the fear of separatist Islam. They want them to instead assimilate into French culture. China's doing the same thing here. They just did the same thing France did. They banned uh, conservative Muslim women from being able to wear what we see women around here wearing, right? The Saudi Arabian, like, you know, I've got the black mask in front of my face. You just see my eyes. I'm covered in the black burqa. China's doing the same thing here. Are people protesting it? Are there terrorist attacks in Xinjiang? Yes, there are. And so there is a there is a a separatist Islamist threat in China, and there's the same type of war on terror stuff that's going on domestically within China, in Xinjiang, Tibet, Xinjiang Incorporated, and Mongolia until the end of World War II, when the Soviet Union, uh, I believe, made it part of its thing. But in any case, so take away Mongolia, and you've got basically today's People's Republic of China. And it's really uh, Qianlong who added both of these. That's and you know that Tibet is America's favorite cudgel in terms of like, we want to beat the Chinese Communist Party because the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan holy man, was chased out by Mao. And, uh, and he's been uh, America's favorite sort of Hollywood holy man ever since. He's that's, you know about the Dalai Lama, right? You've heard of the Dalai Lama. He's the head of Tibetan Buddhism, and he is a refugee from here since the, the, the communist era. But Tibet has been a part of China since the late 1700s. And why was, uh, like, a, is it Dalai Lama, then why was he ruling in Tibet during the, the truth that had been the result? That's a great question. You know what? Because... China did not, okay, how was China, how, how was China ruling, when they took Hong Kong, did they say, okay, Hong Kong, you're going to be like, just like mainland China, you have to follow the same rules we do. No, there's this thing called one country, two systems. You have local traditions in Hong Kong from your 160 years as a British colony, a colonial subjects of the British Empire, owned by the British, you have traditions there, so, so those local traditions, we will respect and allow you to keep them for a generation or two. In 50 years, you will fully return to us. But in the meantime, one country, two systems. So they don't impose. This is very Confucian. This is, don't you see it? In the same way, in Tibet, the Tibetan local ways of life were allowed to remain. They just owed uh, allegiance and all sort of thing, and, and taxes and, and, and military and all sort of stuff. So it was a multi-ethnic and a multi-system empire. Empire meaning there are Tibetans, there are Uyghurs, right? And they allowed them to continue in their ethnic cultural traditions and even allowed their chiefs to continue ruling their lamas. Now, Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism was a theocracy. The religious class ruled like feudal kings in Europe. And the non-religious class, the non-priesthood, were serfs who the, the communists argue that miserable lives of servitude and impoverishment in order to give a good life to the lamas, the lama class live high on the hog in their beautiful, beautiful temples, doing no work at all, while the rest of the Tibetans, fearful of horrible reincarnations and even Tibetan hells, because Tibetan Buddhism is very different, um, lived in, in abject terror, and they were always on their knees before the lama class. That's the Chinese point of view. The Marxist point of view, we liberated you from feudal superstition and, and inequality. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Um, so that's that's just Qianlong's sort of military thing. How many of you have been to the Forbidden City? How many of you expect one day you'll see the Forbidden City? Okay, so when you do, 
this is a really cool picture. This is what it looked like right after the Boxer Rebellion, 1900. This is a 1903 photo of the Forbidden City. Look how, okay, so the Opium War is 1840. This is 1900. 60 years of into the century of humiliation when China is impoverished, when all the, the British and French and other Western powers are making China pay its money to the Western powers. Every time they lost a war, you've got to pay us a cut of your annual revenues. So things just went into uh, serious disrepair and such. That was it in 1900, 115 years ago. Here it is today. Nicely cleaned up. Um, when you walk it, notice that this central part here, so it's a little marble, right? Magnificent. Um, men, when we go to our interim mm -hmm. next month, you'll notice that this has the, um, this architectural shape is only shared by two other, and I, don't, I forget what the third one is, but the, the only other um, temple in all of China that is allowed to have this double eaved architecture to eaves is Confucius Temple in Chufu in his hometown. His tomb is right behind it because this is this is the emperor's style. But in any case, so you notice that there's a central marble place here, and they've got it. Well, they've got it uh, gated off so that people can't walk up it. It has dragons on it, five clawed sumptuary, five clawed dragons. So only the emperor walked up the center. And on the right were his uh, scholars, and on the left were his generals. So the other entrances were for the one and the womb, right? The civil and the military. Um, but anyway, so that's the outside of the palace. And here's the inside. There's the inside long ago, same, same photographer. And this is the emperor's throne. And again, three places. So you can picture whenever, well, uh, I'll stop. Um, this is what I brought this up to show you. When Yongzhong died, and he was like, I don't want there to be the kind of confusion there was that made people not trust me when Kangxi died. And I became emperor. So what did he do? What was his system? He, put the, he wrote it down and then put it behind the throne. He put it above the throne, behind this sign. So that's where it was. And then there was the other piece of paper there, right? And so only when he died did anybody have permission to like get a ladder or go up there and pull the thing out from behind the side. So when you see that, when you go to that, that temple now and you see that, you're like, oh, that's, I hope you'll like tell the story to the other people. And that's what it looks like today. Uh, anything else? I can't wait until you leave so I can get back to my five minute college student. So um, how authentic is a lot of it? I mean, I know a lot of it's authentic. Uh, and like the, oh yeah, they repair all the time. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure they repaint Versailles too. Okay, this I'm going to ask you to enjoy at home. What is this? Oh, this is madness. This is a contemporary painting of the High Chain. And when I took the Harvard course, we were asked to sort of narrate what the visual arts show us. Because this was painted in the 1700s. Oh. And so they're not making it up. This is what it did look like. And so it is incredibly interesting because the details are wonderfully fine. It looks better on your computer. But you know, it's like you see the daily life. It is so full of specific activity going on. I can enjoy this long night. On land. You see what's happening here? It's like there are people flying kites. There are people flying kites here. Did they use pencil or something? I don't know. But it goes on and on and on and on. Countryside, river, countryside, river, countryside, river. Very famous. Rainbow Bridge. And so you see shipping life, you see this, this barge here with all this, all this merchandise on it and such, and you see the barge pullers here, and you see all sorts of activity because they're yelling from the, the bridge, and they're yelling from here, hey, watch out, you're gonna hit the bridge, and all sorts of stuff. There's a bit of a panic going on there. So, uh, so you see the economic life, you're starting to see the city life, 
You're, you see transportation, you see all sorts of stuff. But you're still not in the city, you're on the outskirts. And there are the city walls. And once you pass those, go through the gate, you're inside the city. This is Suzhou. This is not Beijing. Suzhou is a, a Yangtze area town. It's still capital. Somewhere. Um, and it goes, so you know, there are the streets. That's what street life looked like before the Industrial Revolution, before the West came. This was traditional China. Um, and it's an incredible thing. And just look how much, look how far it goes. How, how large is this in real life? Well, let's see how large mine is. I bought this in the Forbidden City. Now, this is not the same. This is not, but that's called Glorious Suzhou. Suzhou was not the capital. This is the Qingming Scroll. It's more famous than that one. The Spring Festival Scroll. So come on, let's see. Have I shown you how they do this? Yeah. Yeah, you were. You were yeah. And so, let's just see. It's beautiful, too. You're welcome to come and have a look. Please be careful and don't step on it. At the International Expo in Shanghai in 2008, I think. They had this um, on a 20 foot high um, digital monitor, high definition, and animated. So this scene was animated, and you saw the sun come up and go down over it, and you saw these people walking around and selling things. You heard them laughing in the bars. And it was here in Singapore. Uh, Joy Dong and, and uh, Natalie, Natalie, uh, I can't remember her last name right now, but, but Natalie and I, went to it. I had a little voluntary field trip and only two went and it was wonderful. It stretched around the entire uh, Singapore Expo warehouse. We spent hours just walking around watching sunrise and fall. So yeah, so that's, that's pretty much how long it is. <laughs> and this is the authentic size and then there's some, some writing and poetry and you can bet that this is all Qian Long stuff. Because Qianlong, as I hope you noticed, was quite the connoisseur of art and of, uh, of calligraphy and all that. So he was a true Renaissance man, a sage king type. These are the seals of the right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this one that you just showed us is like roughly this size? Yeah, yeah. And if anybody has their chalk, you can, you can stamp it with your your seal. Yeah. But it's really wonderful when you have to, and you can find high definition ones online, the Taipei Museum in, uh, in Taiwan, which stole this when Mao won the Civil War against the, the ROC. They stole all the art from the Imperial City and they took it to Taiwan. So the great art museum is in Taiwan. Uh, and the communists are like, you bastards. Um, you got all our glories. But it's a good thing because Mao went a little, little extreme in the Cultural Revolution and told them to destroy everything old, so good about that, not good enough. Um, but yeah, just seeing, just seeing like the, all of the life going on here. Yeah, yeah, and so you can go to the Taiwan, the, the Taipei Museum's website and they have high resolution ones that are huge and you can scroll around and see close-ups of all of this. And it really is time travel. It's just most amazing thing in the world. I once had students write a, a short story based on being in this, and they had to choose a character and write a day in the life of that character long ago in HOC. Wait, wait, what, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? He. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, so how many people do you think would be working on it? How many people would be painting it? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't, I, I, I believe the artist is attributed. Uh, this is one artist. So, you know, Michelangelo does the Sistine ceiling. It's a great, there, there's a great, great, great comparison. That'd be big, epic. The Chinese, they're like, that's not show sure off. Let's make it rollable so you just honor your friends. Uh oh. Cooties. Student cooties. And 
I'm sorry, but it's just an exquisite culture when you have beautiful, beautiful silk. We've got a right to, to not want to lose our culture to the twerp culture. Okay. okay, remaining seven minutes, I do want to hear your... And I bought this in the library that Chien Long woke up every morning and studied in, in the Forbidden City. It's, it's now the bookstore in the Forbidden City. You go to the very back, right side, very back, back wall. You can go no further into the Forbidden City. On the right side, there's a bookstore. That was his library where he woke up every morning and read the Shu Jing before leading for the day so he could be like Yao Shu and Yu 3,000 years after the Shu Jing was written. It's a, it's a remarkable thing. Anyway, so uh, did thoughts on, thoughts on that or questions or anything else? Yeah. I had you read it. You read about the succession story. I showed you like cool connections to make about the. But what else? Was this illuminating in any way in trying to, to in furthering your understanding of Qing government, Qing culture, Qing Chinese society, imperial? I didn't realize how um, how rigorous it was, even on the scale of like the um, the, it, the imperial like grandsons. How deep into education he had to go, because like he had to learn all of those classics by like twelve, I think, and then that was before he was even moved up to imperial son. To imperial son. And also, I wasn't sure, like, <laughs> is that something that was common to be able to know all of the classics by 12? Or was that, like, an outstanding characteristic of Chan Long, that he was so able? I don't have it with me. The four books, the four books are not very long. The Analects, the Mencius, the Gashwe, the Great Learning, and the uh, classic of the Ming, so, um, so, uh, the Golden Mean. The middle way. Um, it's a very thin book. In fact, it's thinner than this book. This is what you are reading, right? This is what you read. So it's thinner than this. So it's not as if you're memorizing s as much as if you were memorizing the five classics the Shu Jing, Shu Jing, 310 poems, 300 art poems, all sorts of stuff. And, uh, and the four books were the ones that, since the Song Dynasty a thousand years ago, were the imperial examination texts that your scholar officials had to. To test him to get to become scholar. So did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And then something else that was kind of interesting to me was how. By the way, I, I wanted to say that uh, because of what you see Chris doing right now, when the end of the semester came last last semester, Chris got a manual grade raise because I was like, "There's your GPA says one thing about you, but what it doesn't say about you is what you bring to a class," and that, and that's why his grade was higher on the report card than it was before I changed it. Go ahead. Um, was how, like, the le how he, how the lessons were structured where, I think this is on page four, where um, the students repeated after the teacher. Like, they kind of had to memorize the lessons before they understood anything that he was saying. That was kind of amazing to me. I mean, I'm not sure how large the lessons were, but they had to, like, learn them before they started to memorize what all the characters and everything. They, but they had to be able to read it. Before. Where is that? What page is it? On page, page four. four. Was that when they were doing the thousand character classic? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was it. Yeah. Five. Where was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean. How is she going to teach a five-year-old to memorize a thousand characters? Start by just going, there's, there's a character, memorize it, one by one. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, it sounds, it sounds good. And this was like, like just the common five-year-old who can understand it. This isn't just the imperial family. Oh, uh, more than this. Yeah, the common one, because every family wants 
its son to take that civil service exam and become an official. Because that is the only elite class there is. You can be a rich merchant, but you're only rich. You're not honored. You got power. You got influence. You can bribe, but you're not honored. Nobody. Right? So yeah, so even the rich merchants had their kids doing the same thing because they wanted honor, not just wealth. Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly interesting. It's the difference between the European system or Western system and more central and materialist. And money and wealth, of course, Chinese money is centered on the farm. Yeah, what, what, you know, what struck you about Chen Because you're seeing him as a young man. Uh, it's a remarkable chapter. What's, what stood out for you? What details about Chen Long as a young man, knowing that he's going to assume the throne? And what's like Harry's question? I'm like, yeah, Eric mentioned how Yong um, Yong Jin um, ordered his sons to bow to the cultures. Maybe it was like his, and maybe it was part to do with his parents. Like, on him, and especially um, Kang Tsung's influence on him, um, taking him hunting with him, teaching him all the traits that uh, he needed to become a man. Also, like I think it was important that um, Kang Tsung also took him to the, I think it was the military planning, one of the military planning meetings they had, and he, um, uh, Kang Tsung uh, stressed the importance that, you know, how important it is to know, like, when to attack your enemy and, like, when to, when to trust your commanders, and it was, like, all, all of these different things that added up. Um, really helpful and turned him into a, 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 per, like a perfect leader. It's worth, it's worth considering putting this sort of summative idea and how do we describe the Qing and you just turned on the slide bulb. The Han Chinese were Confucian. I'm sorry, and so they, they were not valuing this. They were always valuing this, the one. Because that's the Han Chinese. The, the civil is more important than the military. But these are what Elliot calls conquest dynasties. They are war people from north of the Great Wall, and so they do, by necessity, value the... And so what they brought was, and you saw how they did assimilate, they did Zenocide, they did become Confucian, but your point brings it out strongly. They also said, we are gonna be both. So if, if, any, if any dynasty was perfectly 100% one and one, civil and military, it's the chain, um, which, it's possibly why some people say it's the best dynasty China ever had. Um, but anyway. All right, so so now watch the old Qin Long, who was so terrified that he would not live up to Kangxi's expectations and all sort of stuff. Watch him deal with uh, George III's ambassador, George McCarthy. Back to Cameron. So finish that for the next class. It will take you beyond that to the end of the Opium War. Chen Long's mom is worth remembering too. He was a really good son. He was a mama's boy. He loved his mother. He was so good to her, they loved him. <laughs>